I get the honor to bring you our, our second installment of Living on E, uh, so it's Living on E Part 2. Um, I'm going to call mine The Conversation. You're like, really, The Conversation? Is that really a, a title? Yes, it is, because everything always started and ended in conversation. All right? So we talked about separation last week, and that was a good word brought by Pastor Lee. But I get to talk about transformation. So first service didn't know how to have any fun. So I'm going to hope you guys know how to have fun in about 2014, right? So back in 2014, Words with Friends was everywhere. Let me tell you how big Words with Friends was in my family. You ready? We'd be at the dinner table, three to five feet apart from each other, playing Words with Friends with each other. We'd be in the living room, <laughs> playing Words with Friends with each other. <laughs> I don't know how it was in your family, but Words with Friends was like, it, was, it took over. Right? And I think the word transformation would have been a really big, really big point, especially if you had like a triple point word, if you had like the right letter on the right tile. Yeah, y'all didn't have no fun in 2014. I did. It was awesome. Um, but transformation, it's a heavy word. Some of us don't know what transformation is. Some of us want to go through it because, you know, some, maybe a reason we're going through this transformation is maybe because we're... Uh, We're trying to get rid of a bad habit. Maybe we're going through this transformation because we're trying to get rid of a a bad lifestyle. Or we're going through this transformation maybe because we're trying to get rid of an effects of a life. A person that did you wrong or or something happened. We're trying to get rid of that. Trying to cleanse it. Trying to get rid of it. Now let me ask you a question. We're still in the new year. Basically, it's going faster than ever. My dad says, when you get older, you just go faster. I didn't believe him until now. Um, But... uh, how many of you guys are going through a 14-day transformation? Like something you saw on Instagram or something, like a 14-day buns, uh, guns and abs, <laughs> a little 14-day transformation. <laughs> uh, how many of you guys are going through a 24, like a, a cleanse? Or how many of you guys are going through a 30-day transformation? Anybody? How many of you guys at the beginning of the year started the year out seeking transformation? And you may have gone off and on, but you're, you're still searching for it. <sighs> well... Just like our body needs transformation, our spirit needs transformation as well. Our mind and our soul, it it continually needs to grow. Let's talk about what transformation is. Transformation is us having a face-to-face encounter with God. (laughs) Y'all don't even know. Face-to-face is us, uh, sorry, transformation, I did it last service too. Transformation is us having a face-to-face with a friend. We'll get to one of the reasons why we're lonely and depressed is because we don't have friends. I'll get to that in a minute. Don't you worry. And my third point, or it's going to be fourth point in the notes, but to see if it is all what it meant, what it was all meant to be, if it's all like worth the stuff, worth the work. As soon as we have a face-to-face with God and a face-to-face with friends, we'll be able to face our fruit. Now, I want to share with you how Saul's life was transformed, right? You see, Saul's public life before and after his conversation with Christ was publicly known. It was a public fact, and it was known by hundreds, probably even thousands. It was was undeniable. His transformation from a murderer to a lover of God's people was undeniable. See, he wasn't claiming just this private, you know, in my room, by myself experience. Nah, he exclaimed it to the masses that he had seen the risen Savior Jesus and had received forgiveness for what he had done and now is on a mission. Now, what I want to leave you with right now is the transformation we've all been searching for, we've all been looking for, we've all been, it's like, I need it. The transformation we desire is often found behind the conversation we're choosing to avoid. So, number one, be sensitive to the knock or get knocked out. Let me read you this story. And if you want to follow me in your Bibles, I got the hard copy right here because it's cool. Yeah, I'm going to be reading out of Acts 9, 1 through 19. I'm going to give you the backstory on Saul really quick. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priests 
He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on the mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Conversation. Can I ask you guys this question? How many of you guys have ever been knocked off a horse? Knocked off a goat? <laughs> if you're pretty big, you can ride them. I got one of those. He's huge. How many of you guys have ever felt like life knocked you down? Have you guys ever felt like life just gave you that knockout punch and you're not, you're not seeing the, the light right now? Well, let me give you a little story, a little analogy. Let's say we're all living in God's house, right? It's beautiful. It's amazing. That's God, right? God's the best of the best. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit man it. They make sure we're good, make sure we're taken care of. But here's the thing. Some of us, and you know who you are, are the rebellious teenagers, <laughs> you know, back in those 90s and 80s movies, all the kids' doors had those keep out stickers, like those skulls, like, don't come in here, danger zone. God gave us our own, our own room. He gave us our own life to do with what we please. He gave us free will in the hopes that we'd live for him. And the cool thing is he gave us this list of everything to do and not to do, and it's called the Bible. You see, but some of us, like I said, you know who you are. We want to do our own thing, which is basically everything God said not to do. <laughs> and all the while, the Holy Spirit's knocking. The Bible says he's a gentleman. He's not going to break in your door. And I don't know how you were raised. My mom and dad never let us have a lock on our door. Ain't nothing we didn't do that, 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 that is that private. And my dad said, son, you can have a lock on your door when you are married. That's about it. And I'm like, gotcha, dad. Um... <laughs> But we didn't need that lock when we were kids. But God, giving us our own life, he's like, okay, live your life, hoping we'll live for him. Some of us don't. It's, it's life. We're humans. We're not perfect. We have our own desires. And um, the Holy Spirit's knocking. He's like, hey, I just want to talk with you. Hey, how are you? How many of you guys know you need that conversation? You feel like you just have this pressure on your chest. And you need someone. You need a conversation. And he's knocking. But I want you to imagine this. When we have ignored the, the knocking so much for so long, I want you to, Mr. Drew, can you come here real quick? I'm going to use you real quick. He didn't know this. I kind of talked to him about it. But Mr. Drew here is a police officer. I think he's SWAT too. It's cool. <laughs> he looks like he's being SWAT. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so I'm Jesus. I'm knocking. Hey. I come in, and you've, yeah, I just want to talk with you. I just want to check up on you, how you doing. And I'm like, well, Jesus, they're ignoring me. I need you to do what you do. And so what Jesus does, like SWAT, he show him what SWAT does with the door, boss. He take the battering ram and just go, boom. It just, he just completely breaks so Thank you, Mr. Drew. Thank you. He completely knocks down our door because while we're in a room, we're blasting life, man. You know those kids with like punk rock? Yeah! Just rocking out. But when we're in our spiritual room, oh, we're blasting life. We're blasting the lies. Blasting the deceits. We're blasting, oh, you should be this way. You should be this tall. You should have this much money. You should have this. When God made us perfect. God made us perfect. Why should we need to listen? But we do. Because it's cool. That's another sermon. Sorry. God knocks down our door for transformation. God's not going to knock down your door just to tell you dinner's ready. Trust me, I could smell it. <laughs> if dinner's ready, I don't even need to tell me. I'm coming. I'm running. God's not going to knock down, bust your life open. Jesus ain't because he wants to give us transformation. So my question, have any, has anybody ever been knocked off? Has, any, has anybody ever been felt like life knocked them down? Has anybody ever been in a tragedy, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a, of a car, a financial status? Have you guys ever been in a struggle? 
Have you guys ever been in a bad situation? Bet y'all think this is coffee, don't you? It's water. I'm here to tell you that your, your situation, the situation we think is so bad, wasn't bad at all. It was God trying to get a hold of you so you can get a hold of, hold of your testimony. I don't know what story you, can, you walked in here with, but I'm here to tell you today that your knockdown isn't the end of your story. Your knockdown isn't the end of your life. It isn't over for us. It's the beginning of a new chapter. The devil wants to tell you you're done, you're finished, you're over, but we're going to learn today through Paul's life that our knockdowns are the setups. I'm not talking like my dad. I'm not doing sat ups. They're set, S-E-T, ups for our transformation. And, and you see, I said new chapter because when, when we have a book and we turn the page, I don't know what's on the other side. I don't know until, boom, I can read it. I can read it. It's a new chapter. It's a new page. Just because we don't know what's on this side doesn't mean our life is over. We just don't know what God has in store for us. We don't know if it's going to be amazing, which it almost always is. It ain't over. It's not over. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> My second point is this. In order for us to receive our transformation, we have to have a face-to-face -face encounter with God. In, in verse 4 through, I believe, 6, it says, so we just got been talking about he got knocked off his horse and Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul asked, who are you, Lord? The voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The man with Saul stood speechless for they heard the sound of someone's voice, excuse me, but saw no one. So Saul picked himself back up off the, off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind so his companions led him by the hand to Damascus and he remained there blind for three days and not, did not eat or drink. Let me talk to you a little bit. Let me do a little recap on Pastor Lee's talk on last week on Saul. Scholars in the Bible, they talk about how Saul was one of the greatest enemies of the, of the way, greatest enemies of Jesus. And he believed he was God's right hand of justice. He believed he was God's wrath. You see, he was viciously on fire for God. But he, he didn't follow Jesus. Does, it, does that make sense? Let, let me do this. Let me do this real quick. Oh, I wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> I believe in Jesus. But I'm not going to follow. I'm sorry, I believe in God, but I'm not going to follow Jesus because following Jesus takes work. I like it right here. I can say I believe in God. People think I'm a Christian, my life's okay, it's all good, I'll do what I want, ask for forgiveness later, everything's going to be fine, and your life never moves. Nobody ever comes to you for help. You don't ever have your transformation because you're busy sitting down. But following Jesus, like, oh, you want me to talk to this person? Even though J-Box's breath might stink a little bit, I'm going to talk to him. <laughs> oh, oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, you're going over here? I'm a, okay, I'm going to go talk to these people. But Jesus, he didn't shower. You can, you know what I'm talking about? I don't want to talk to them. That's it's following Jesus. It's following what he asks of us. That's the difference. Because my life, you're seeing my actions. It's not, I believe in God, I'm following I'm following his word. Yeah, y'all don't get it yet. Y'all see it at the end of this. Don't worry, I got you guys. He didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. You see, and we can be like Paul. We can have all the money in the world. We can have position. We can have money. We can have status. We can have rank. But at the end of the day, we will always and remain unfulfilled empty, always wanting more of something we can never get enough of. We become insatiable for this transformation, except we don't know where to get it. So we try looking for it at the bottom of a bottle, try looking for it through anything we can put in our mouth. 
through any relationship, whether good or bad, will always end up empty because we're not e-focused. I mean, I mean, you guys are like, really, Jericho, e-focused? E means empty in a car. <laughs> we flipped it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now you got the memo. <laughs> when we're e-focused, actually for you guys it's e-focused because this means full. We get it. <laughs> when we're e-focused, <laughs> it, 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 it's hard. I'm sorry. We focus on eternity. Our actions, when we follow Christ, we're doing what it takes to get our name written in the book of life. But when we're full of F, full of me, full of the now, full of what I want, I'll never get enough. I will never, ever, ever get enough to satisfy my needs. That's why we got to be sensitive to the knock. We get knocked out and live on E. And we need a face-to-face encounter with God. You see, this generation is so funny. Because you get this. They want Jesus to follow them. Come on, Jesus. I know you're with me wherever I go, but I'm, I'm not going to follow you. I want to go this way. I want to live my life. I want to live it over here. Do everything you ask me not to because it feels good. Live on F. But over here, following Jesus, following his word, living on E, living eternity focused. Dang, I did it again, huh? His eternity's over there. <laughs> Fools over here. You guys, you guys know what I'm saying. You see, and this is where Saul goes through what we call an encounter. How many of you guys have ever been to an encounter? Give me a help. Give me a yeah. If you, ever been, if you haven't been to an encounter, go to some of those crazy people who just yell because an encounter is knock your socks off, rock your world. It's an amazing experience where we get to just have that moment with Jesus. It's hard to replicate because it's so real. And it's amazing. I encourage you guys. So let me read. Uh, I already read it. That's right. Your encounter. Can everybody say my encounter? My encounter. My encounter. Is not. Repeat after me. Is not. Is not. My, my transformation. transformation. Let's do it again. My encounter. My encounter. Is, not is not. My transformation. When we get knocked off the horse, when Saul got knocked off the horse, did God get mad at him? Did he yell at him? Did he condemn him? No. He had a conversation with him. Hey, man, why are you doing this to me? Why? And when Saul got knocked off, can I ask you a question? Who picked him up? Do you guys know who picked him up? Was it his friends? No. Bible doesn't say it was friends. Did the Bible say it was the angels? No. When we get knocked off, it is our job, it is our duty to get back up ourselves. If we want something, we go out and work for it. We just watched a movie this weekend, and one of the, it's so cool, like all these movies, they just, they want to be like Jesus. Life never meets us halfway. We got to get up and take it. Jesus has this transformation waiting for us. But if all we do is lay on the ground and be all dramatic, why? Why, Jesus? Why me? We're never going to reach our, our transformation. Now, now, I don't want you guys to misconstrue what I'm saying. I'm not making fun of your tragedy. I'm not making fun of how you got knocked off, why you got knocked off. I'm simply saying what to do when we get knocked off where to go when we get knocked off, right? So, you see, if God would have knocked him off his horse, God wouldn't have just knocked Saul off his horse. He would have smote him, smite, killed. Yeah, he would have, that's Old Testament. But God sent his son, Jesus. And you know what comes with Jesus? Mercy, grace, love, forgiveness, undeserving, unrelenting kindness comes with Jesus. That's why Saul only had to get back up off his horse. That's why Saul only got blinded for three days. Jesus looked at him through the eyes of grace. And Saul went into three days of fasting. Now you're like, but the Bible doesn't say that. It just says he didn't eat or drink. Well, Saul grew up 
in the Jewish tradition. So he knew when something, when he was struggling with something, he knew fasting and praying is the way to go. Ain't no way to get closer to Jesus without, but besides praying and fasting. Now, how many know we could use a little more praying and fasting? I don't know about you guys, but I could use a little more fasting. Um, but that's just me. Uh, you guys can judge your own thing over there. But uh, I could use a little more fasting. But uh, when he got knocked off, see, the Bible, never, the Bible says that Paul never saw Jesus. He only heard his voice. Now, faith comes by what? Faith comes by what? I want you to say a little louder. Faith comes by what? Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And during the season of transformation of this, this time of blindness, we need to do our best to depend on our hearing, depend on our ears way more than our eyes. Because let's say, um, I'm just going to exaggerate, okay? Don't take this literally. Let's say this is a five-foot drop. And y'all are saying, it's only one foot drop, bro. It's only one foot drop. You don't even have to go far. I'm looking at it. That's a five foot drop. I don't believe you. That's five foot. But I have my eyes closed. And you guys are encouraging me. Like Jesus encourages me. If you guys are loving on me, supporting me. Okay. I can't see it, but I'm going to have faith and I trust in you. See how it was a little wobbly? I can't see it, but I trust it in Jesus. I trust it in you. That's how life is. That's how life is. We might, oh, Jesus right there to stabilize us. His grace is sufficient, guys. You see, his friends led him by hand and brought him to Damascus. And it was three days before he could really do anything except simultaneously gasp at the glory of what had just happened. You see, scholars and us, we call scholars, not us, scholars, call this moment the conversion of Paul. I'm sorry, the conversion of Saul. We call it because we know it was like a volcanic eruption, a thunderstorm, and a tidal wave all at once. Pastor Lee might have mentioned it last week, but Paul was the perfect storm. Paul was the greatest weapon for the enemy. He was an unstoppable force, and Jesus was his immovable object. You know what happened? Jesus demolished him. It was amazing. And Saul then turned into the greatest weapon Christianity had ever known besides Jesus. Without Saul, we wouldn't have half the New Testament. Without Saul, Asia, Greece, Rome, they wouldn't know Jesus. They wouldn't have been influenced. All right, all right, all right. Y'all taking up all my time. Good gracious. In this time of transformation, this time of blindness, we need to talk less. Can I ask you guys a question? How many of you guys are married? Right, raise your hands. Okay, so men... How many of you guys think your wife would like it if all you did was talk about your day and then all you did was talk about your work and all you did was talk about the shop and all you did was talk about sports and all you did was talk about your car and after that, you went to bed. All you did was talk, 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 and then you went to bed. How do you think your wife would feel about that? You women... You to say amen, because I'm, I'm talking with you. I'm on your team right now. <laughs> how, many, how, many, how many of you guys would want that from your husband? Because what if something in your day needed to be let out and he needed to be your ear? You needed to get something on your chest, and the only person you could talk to like that is your husband, but all he did was talk about his day. And the same way for you women. If all we talk about, well, all we, all you talk about, <laughs> if all we talk about is the gossip, the chicle, the tea, I don't know what you want to call it. Um, huh? Cheese man, there it is. <laughs> if all we did was talk and talk and talk, and what, what we heard at the hair shop, the nail salon, even though, we, yeah, um, and we just went to bed and we didn't get to hear our husband's side of the day, how do you think our husband would feel? I wouldn't like that. I know when I get married, I am definitely not going to like that. I'm like, hold up, sit there. I got to tell you my story now. We share it now. And, and for us single people, we have friends. And maybe why the reason we don't have friends is because all we do is talk and talk and talk. We don't give them any chance to tell us about them. We're supposed to sharpen each other and grow. But how can we do that if it's just one person talking the whole time? That was all for free, man. Some of us, and take this kind-hearted and serious at the same time, 
Some of us need a, a season of such a mouth. Because how we talk to our spouse, because how we talk to our friends is the exact way we talk to God. Prayer, all it is, is a conversation with you and your papa, with, you, with me and my creator. And if all I can do is talk and talk, I never let him get to talk to me. I never get to hear his word for me. And I know, I'm not, I'm, okay, this is what I'm not saying. I'm not saying don't get what's on your chest off your chest. Go ahead. He wants to hear it. He wants to have this conversation. He wants to know the ins and outs of you. He wants you to tell him the ins and outs of you. God, I'm struggling. God, thank you for this prosperity. He wants to know about your day. But in the end, don't just leave. Don't just go away. Don't just say, Jesus, thank you for this food. Amen. I'm going to eat. That's that kind of prayer. Bye. Thank you, Jesus. Bye. Nah. You might have to look like a little hula girl. Just wait in his presence. Just wait. Or there's a hula girl do like this, huh? <laughs> God, thank you. I'm here waiting. You can put some worship on. You can get an inspiration. You can get a word from the music. But as long as we keep talking, we won't be able to hear anything. Because it's all about us. And so I encourage you to when we talk to our spouse, when we talk to our friends, and more importantly, when we talk to God, don't use all the minutes. Stop and wait on him. Because he has a word for you. He has a conversation for you. That's about to change your world. About to change your life. I got to hurry up. Y'all talk too much. So my third point is this. In order for us to receive this transformation, we have to have a face-to-face -face with our friends. Now here at CP, we live and breathe that. We're not made to live this life alone. I mean, we're, we're pretty cool. I mean, I'm... Y'all pretty cool. I think you're pretty cool. But I'm not going to stand here and say I'm, I'm better than Jesus Christ, who had 12 friends that he just walked around with. He, they went shopping together. <laughs> they went Bible studying together. They went to Starbucks together. They did life together. They had parties together. They went to each other's houses together. They went to spiritual warfare together and for each other. And who am I to stand here and say, no, nah, I don't need friends. I don't need it. I'm good. I'm good. And unfortunately, that's the present culture here today. I'm a macho man. I don't need nobody. I am Miss Independent. I don't need nobody's help. Ain't no, I don't need nobody. Here's the thing. That's why we feel lonely. That's why we feel depressed. That's why we never feel like we're good enough. We can't measure up. That's why we feel like dull. That's why this present generation has so many nights filled with binging on Netflix and eating a tub of ice cream. We ain't got no friends. So today, I, I just want to encourage you, go get some friends. Do some life with some friends. You see, an encounter leads us to God because every time God is getting ready to elevate us, he has a guide there. Some of us, you might have come into a financial prosperity season where you have too much or you, you have more than you've ever seen before, and you just don't know what to do with it. You need a guide. You might have a business. You, have, you might have more employees. You might have a lot of kids, and you need help. Uh, that's, that's your business. But at some point in time, we're all going to need a friend to help us out. We're all going to need a guide. Because the most I can elevate myself is like maybe like this much, maybe like two, three inches. I can't jump either. I got like those... Low hops. <laughs> I, can't, I can't jump high. I'm, mm -mm. But you see, when God chooses to elevate us, he'll lift us to a point where we need somebody to lean on. We've never been here before. Our legs are shaky. We need somebody who's been there or who at least is a step ahead of us. Because that's all God. I'm not asking you guys to be perfect. I'm not here proclaiming to be perfect. I'm just saying all we need to be is one step ahead in the right direction for God to be able to use us. Amen? Amen. In Saul's case, his guy would be Ananias. Let me read you some scripture. Um, skadoosh, right. Now, there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling Ananias. Yes, Lord. He replied, the Lord said, go over to Straight Street for the, to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man named 
and asked for a, man, for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so that he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he's authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go. For Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. The only reason Ananias even heard the voice of God is because he was living on E, and he's been sensitive to the knock. You see, the Bible says there was a believer in the town of Damascus. So it wasn't like Ananias wasn't known. He made it a public fact. This is who I am. I'm not a little closet believer. Nah. You need some help? I'll pray for you. You need some help? I'll pray. Let's go. Let's go pray for this person. No, I, the town knew. He was a believer. And my question, is there any believers here in Yakima? Is there any believers here in the, in the Lower Valley, in Wapato, in Zilla? Are there any believers in West Valley, East Valley? Are there any believers in Sela? Are there any believers online? That God is getting ready to use. And you see, there, there was a, there was a, um, there was a, there, there's a comma in the Bible. It says, yes, pause, Lord. So if you can imagine with me, uh, Ananias was probably like um, doing some farm work. Might have been milking his goat. I don't know what he was doing. He could have been eating dinner. He'd be doing some laundry. Ananias, yes, Lord, I need you to go talk to this person. But Lord, how many know Ananias is just like us? If you don't, now you know. Now you know. (laughs) Ananias is just like us, man. Ananias was told to go talk to that person. He had his pushbacks. He said, God, he hurts people like me. He makes fun of people like me. He kills people like me. He stands by and watches people like me be killed. Why, why would I ever go talk to that person? Nowadays, it's, that person's breath smells bad. Why would I talk to that person? <laughs> you can see how it's like really the, the whys, the ifs, yeah, whatever. Ananias is just like us follows Christ. He is sensitive to the knock. And when God called on him to go and heal Ananias and pray for him, Ananias didn't want to go and lead Saul. He did not want to go and be friends with Saul. He didn't want to go pray for him. But you know what happened? The conversation that God had with Ananias is that it's already a done deal, son. I already gave him a vision of a man named Ananias coming and praying for him and laying his hands on him and healing him so that he might see again. God said, you're going, end of conversation. Because, oh, jeez, don't get too far ahead of yourself. Sorry. We could be living on E, just like Ananias, and have our pushbacks, have our reasons why not. Or why, God? I don't want to. You see, God spoke to Ananias. Ananias spoke up about the problems. God spoke to the problems. Ananias was like, all right, I'll go. Like a little two-year-old throwing a fin in the store. You know what I'm talking about? Where you just like, you want to leave your kid there real quick? <laughs> I don't know if you guys would never do that. Um, all right. See, there are times for thinking, th- thinking things through. But there are also times where we have to go and trust that God will take care of everything in the end. You see, what's amazing is that God never gave us a map with all the stops, all the destinations, all the gas stations, all the food stops, all the obstacles. He never did that. Like, here's a map. Go from point A to point B, and I'll get you there. You see, it was so cool. If you're reading the Bible with us, we just got done with uh, how the Israelites entered into the, the promised land. You know what happened, Kennedy? <laughs> he prayed. And God took the Jordan River, and about a mile upstream, made it a wall. You know, like in, in Lord of the Rings or in Narnia, he made the water stand tall. And just like the Red Sea, he made the ground dry. Drown dry. <laughs> the ground dry. They didn't even step in mud. 
They're like, God, how are we going to cross this river? We got like a couple hundred thousand people. All right. When they trust in God, God makes a way. And it's always been like that for people of faith. Let me give you one instance. Abraham. Y'all know Abraham? Give me, give me a yeah if you know Abraham. I wasn't very confident, but I, I'll take it. <laughs> Abraham, he is old, old as dirt. And, and God is like, all okay, right, you're going to have kids. You're going to have uh, so many, uh, so many descendants. descendants. There it is. It was a big word. I'm sorry. I couldn't think of it. He, you, he's, you're going to have so many descendants. They'll be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And God's like, Abraham's like, you see me? I'm old, God. I'm old. My wife, her factory shut down. Ain't none of that working. How, how am I supposed to have anything right now? Fast forward to the end of the story. They have a son. That son has two sons. One of the sons has 12. That's where we get the Israelite, the Israel from. There are Jewish people, Israelite people all over the world. Because when we have faith, we don't know how we're going to get there. But God's going to make a way. We just have to trust in him. Amen? Now I want to tell you, there are, always, there are always two parts of a transformation. There is one part, guide, and, two par- and the second part, being guided. Now, I don't know if this is your first time here, your hundredth time here, or if you're like me, I was kind of born back there. So I've been here a minute. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't proclaim to know your story. I, 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 don't, I don't know your story. I don't know how many times you've come. I don't know if this is your first time. All I'm saying is that in order for us to receive or take part in someone's transformation, we have to do our part. You see, Saul went to the house of Judas in Damascus. He was praying. He was fasting. Saul did his part. He was obedient to the Lord. All that he was waiting on was Ananias. God had put a little elbow grease in there, trying to get him to, trying to feed him with the spirit, feed him with faith. Because, oh, yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. Let me give you a short story. I went down to Cali with my dad, and we brought back a couple of trucks, work trucks. Amazing. They can cruise at like 80 miles an hour, and they're amazing. They're amazing. Because we went 80 miles an hour. <laughs> but here's the thing. The man that we bought him from was crazy. For Jesus. This man, I, I, we, we've taught, we've heard that when we confess and when we speak in faith with confidence, God's going to bring the rain. God's going to bring the blessing. And right now, we're praying. God's brought this blessing here, but I know there's more. But you see, I, I was able to see that. I was able to see everything that he had professed in the faith. He has a business and it's booming. His church humongous. He built that church. It's, not, it's, it's a humongous campus, but they spoke that into existence through confidence. When he prays, he prays with confidence and it totally wrecked my world. So, when we pray, we need to confess that Jesus is the Messiah over our lives. Not, Jesus, you're the Messiah. Uh, you're the Messiah? No. Jesus, you're the Messiah, God. I thank you for everything that you have for me, for my future family, for my family right now, for my church, God. I thank you. Calling it as it is, even though it's not here in front of me, I believe it. I call it out. I believe it. Amen. That's what, what, ooh, what's it called? What makes way for the rain. I'm just going to leave it at that. You see, if you're, here, if you're here and you're that person who's seeking transformation, but you feel like you can't understand your life right now, you feel like you can't see, you don't understand, you don't know where you're going to take your next turn, your next business decision, your next financial decision, your next, where are you going to take your family? You don't understand, you don't know. I'm here right now to tell you to either continue praying and fasting, or if you haven't started, begin. And don't stop. Don't stop. God has far too much of us for us to stop praying, for us to stop having a conversation with us, with him. Right? And like Saul, 
you might be waiting for your Ananias. I want to let you know that here at this church, we have Ananiases waiting for you. We have Ananiases in the works. We're building them up because we want to be ready for you to help you through your transformation. Because God didn't call us to just live life alone. He called us to live it with friends. He called us to live, it, live life abundantly. How is one man supposed to harvest hundreds of acres? He can't. He needs friends. He needs people around him. And when we pray for that transformation, it's going to take a conversation that we've been avoiding to receive it. Amen? So, if you don't know, we, as of last week, launched this Plus One campaign. If you guys don't know what it is, it's, it's our Easter campaign. And so, if everybody here, just about one person, we wouldn't have room enough to fill this place standing. We'd have to use the awning out there and the C4 building over there. And, 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 and I'm not just saying it. I'm confessing it in faith. I'm saying the faith. I'm believing that every single one of us and more are going to bring a plus one. We're going to have to use all white chairs. There's going to be people standing over here. There's going to be people standing over there. We're going to have TVs out there for you. We're going to have people in the C4 section. We're going to have so many people here because I'm choosing to confess this over my life, to confess this over my church. The power of the plus one is amazing. The power of a conversation. Barna, parna. All right? And in case you didn't know, Saul was Ananias' plus one. You see, everyone here, ev- everyone, even me, was somebody's plus one at, at one time. You might have not received a physical invitation, but I just want to let you know you've been prayed for. I have grandparents who prayed for me even, bo- even before my parents were even born. They prayed for God's grace over their life. They prayed for God's grace over my parents' life. And before I was born, they prayed grace, for God's grace over my life. And today it's my turn. I'm 21 years old. It's my turn now to start professing and confessing faith over my life, my kids' life. I don't have any kids. My future kids' life (laughs) and their kids' life. It's it's a process. It's faith. Faith. And it's a never-ending, undeserving, a never unfailing amount of grace. Amen. Everyone who's, been, who's here has been a plus one at one time. You see, someone loved us, loved us enough to make us a plus one. In case you haven't heard, and I love you in a while. Love you. You're loved. You're wanted, and you're special. I want to give that to you. You say, and if we say we are followers of Christ, our ability to make friends out of those people like Saul is monumental. Our, our ability to make friends either helps them obtain their transformation or it lets them fail repeatedly at their transformation. Us not having friends is a big problem. That means we're not helping anybody with their transformation at all. Number four, face the fruit. And what I mean by face the fruit is face the results of the transformation. So let me read you uh, two more verses. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. I don't know about you guys, but I really believe the food he ate was some tacos, rice, beans, and salsa. Because how many know that's the food of champions? That'll get you up in the morning. It's amazing. You don't even have to clap. I'm going to give myself a pound on the back on that one. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Paul's eyes were opened. When we go through our transformation, we'll be able to see through the eyes of grace. When Jesus knocked us off, 
He saw us through the eyes of grace. When Ananias came, even though he didn't want to, he came kicking and fussing like a child. He saw Saul through the eyes of grace. You know how I know? Because he didn't come to him with suspicion. Hey, you saw? Nah, I'm just going to walk away. Can I ask you a question? Did, did, do you, does the Bible say he re- recriminated Saul? You from Tarsus, you that Saul dude who kills people of the way? Are you the person who, who takes people in chains when they don't deserve it? Are, are you that person? No, the Bible says that Ananias approached Paul and said, Brother Saul. A lot of times when we get in those conversations, right, the conversations with those Sauls, we can't call them as they are. We have to speak in faith for what God had already made them to be. They're, everybody out there who's not here are our brothers and sisters. And it's our job to make them feel that love. Yeah. Now, if, 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 if some of us left and came back, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't want to hear the conversation, hey, where you been? Hmm? I wouldn't. Mike, I, I came back because I wanted to forget that mess, not talk about it. But here at Changing Point, it's not where you been. I'm glad to see you. How can I help you? You look good this morning. Where do you want to sit? We show love. We call you brother. We call you sister because we see you through the same eyes of grace God sees us through. That makes sense? All right. You see, Saul received the ability to look through the eyes of grace at his encounter, and he put his grace to work by extending the grace given to him. He learns how to communicate to the separate, everybody out there through the eyes of grace. I, we can't get mad at those people, especially the, if they don't know. We can't get mad at them. We need to love them. We need to love them. We need to have grace, right? You see, part of our transformation is being able to look at people through the same eyes of grace that Jesus looks at us with. Let me read you a passage from Romans 11. It says, it is the same today for a few people of Israel have remained faithful because of God's grace. His undeserved kindness in choosing them. And since it's through God's, work, God's kindness and it's not by their good works, for in that case, God's grace wouldn't be what it really is. And God's grace is free and undeserving. I can't earn God's grace. I can't buy God's grace. I can't play the piano for God's grace. I can't preach for God's grace. I can't work for it. I can't work for his love. I can't buy his mercy. You guys think that just because we're pastor's kids, we don't go, any, go through anything. You guys might, for some reason, think we have it easy, but no, we go through stuff. And it's only because of grace that I'm standing here. It's only because of his mercy that I'm even getting to be able to talk to you guys. He's being, bringing me through things. I'm going through my season of transformation. You see, but some of us, I'm not going to say anybody in here. Out there. Some of us that say we follow Christ won't extend the same grace that God has freely given to us. And therefore, we're hindering not only our own transformation, but the transformation of those around us, those close to us, those people that God's going to lead us to. We're, if we can't see people out of, through love, through grace, how are we ever supposed to grow? The Bible says love always wins. A love that doesn't temper easy. A love that never gives up. And how many know that we deserve to be given up on plenty of times over? But Jesus doesn't give up on us. Amen? You see, Ananias then lays his hands on Saul and prays for his healing. Saul's eyes are open. He's baptized and he eats. Man, I bet them tacos were good back in the day. His strength is restored, and he spends time in Damascus learning what it means to be a disciple. Ananias, even though he didn't want to meet him, he didn't want to go talk to Saul, ends up helping Saul become a follower of Christ. You do not know what that one conversation we've been avoiding with that one coworker, that one sibling, that one parent is, holds behind it. We don't know what kind of healing. We don't know what kind of transformation. We don't know.
And this Sunday, mm, this Sunday is, is a really big Sunday for us. This Sunday is the last Sunday that we're able to sign up for this encounter. It's, it's our last Sunday to sign up for us to take a, a step in the right direction towards our transformation. I invite you. I don't want a tragedy. I don't want a struggle. I don't want a bad situation to have to force you to look to Jesus. I want us to want to. I want us to follow Christ and follow his word for our, our lives. And all that takes place at the encounter. See, if you've been waiting on the sidelines and waiting on your own transformation while you're watching everybody else be blessed because of their transformed life, they get blessing upon blessing, blessing upon prosperity upon blessing. How many want some blessing? Yeah. I want some blessing. I want a lot of that blessing. I want the windows to open wide on my life. How, but in order for us to transition into that time of blessing, we have to be transformed first, man. We have to be transformed first. And here at Changing Point, the thing that we have for you in order for you to take the step is called the encounter. Like I said before, it's life-changing. It'll knock your socks off, man. The time with Jesus is unparalleled. It's unparalleled. And if you want to sign up at the end of this message, ask for Ms. Taylor at the encounter with this big old thing that says encounter. She's going to hook you up. She's going to hook you up. You see, not only do we have an encounter, an invitation to your transformation, we have classes that, like Paul in Damascus, like Saul in Damascus, helps us learn what it means to be a disciple. Because we don't want you to go to encounter, think that's the, the end of everything. We don't want you to think that the encounter is the answer to everything. No. It's a step in the right direction. And we don't want you to go out in the world and just fall on your face. We want you to know what it means to be a disciple. We want, you, we want you to know what it means to be a follower of Christ, what it means to be a life group leader. And if you so choose to continue this journey of transformation, we have more classes for you, more steps to take. Like we have point of growth, point of freedom, changing my world one and changing my world two. Literally, the classes mean the points. They're going to set you free and give you so much knowledge. It's going to be amazing, Right? So if you've come today and you've come to church a little bit, you, you say that you're a follower of Christ, I have a challenge for you. It's more like an encouragement, really. But I want you and I to jump into this plus one campaign like the world depended on it because literally it does. Your friend's world, your coworker's world, your sibling's world, depends on you getting, getting them here. They don't know Jesus, and they're waiting on that conversation you keep avoiding, that we keep avoiding. So I encourage you, bring people. You can even give them a ride, buy some pizza or something, get them here. Get them here. Make it fun. Make it exciting. Because that's what Easter's all about. It's about our risen Savior coming back to life. It's, it's never been done before. Therefore, it's super cool. And then they don't know that until they come, right? People need us to be their Ananias. People need us to have that conversation with them. Because so many people have this pressure in their chest. So many people have this need to talk to somebody that sometimes it might be, hey bro, how you doing? How's life going? Oh, it's going. Or they're just going to go, Wah. they're basically going to hit a valve and it's just going to release and they're going to leave feeling so much better and boom, you've had the conversation. It, it, how are you doing? And you continue, you continue to pray for them. Hey bro, how you doing? Hey sis, how you doing? It's not, I'm not asking you to be perfect. I'm not asking you to research uh, Revelations 22, the, verse of meaning, uh, the meaning of verse 3. I'm not asking you to do that. All I'm asking you to do is have a conversation. Go and have coffee. I don't like coffee. 
Go and have a burger. <laughs> go, go out and, and just make it you. Because that's what those people need. They need a little bit of you in their lives. They're going to pe- be people that don't look like us. They're going to be people that don't smell like us. They're going to be people that don't have the same smile as us. They're going to be people that don't work like us. They're going to be people who have gone places that us church people would never go, even though we probably went there before we came to church. Yeah. There are going to be people who have said things that might have hurt us or hurt the people around us. But those same people need Jesus more than they know. And what's cool is they have a person right next to them that's fighting with the, okay, God. It's fighting with the conversation. We don't know what kind of, con- what kind of transformation comes behind the, tr- behind the conversation. I think I said that right. We don't know what kind of transformation lies behind our conversations. Now, if, if you're coming here and this is your first time, or you're coming here as a last resort and, and end all like, Jericho, I can't, I don't know where to go. I, don't, I can't see why my life is worth living anymore. I can't see it. I'm here to tell you that the thing that you're missing is spelled J E S U S. It's the only thing that's missing. And once we invite him into our lives, once we follow his word for our lives and have that conversation, forever will our lives be changed. It might not. You see, my mom has answered prayers in this room right now. Some of these prayers took 10, some of these prayers took 20 years to come true. I'm not saying that that's only how God works. God might work next week. God might work in a month. But the more and the more that we pray, the more and the more things are going to come true. Things are going to come to light. If we confess it with that God fed inside, he has put inside of us. I encourage you, to those who are seeking transformation, we have the encounter here for you. It's a three-day experience, and it's absolutely amazing. And before I ask Pastor Lee up here, I want you guys to remember this one thing. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is undeserving. God's grace is never ending. I'm never failing. I know I don't deserve his grace but I'm here because somebody prayed for me. I was somebody's plus one. And I know every single one of you here now know that you were loved, that you were cared for, that you're thought about. Some of us think we're invisible sometimes. Not to Jesus. Not to God. You've been prayed for. Even though you can choose to deny it, you can choose to say no, you've been prayed for. And we've been here waiting for you since day one. We've been preparing for you. And if you haven't heard it in a while, I love you. If you haven't heard it in a while, we're thinking about you. If you haven't heard it in a while, Jesus is always there. The Holy Spirit's knocking. Will you open the door and have a conversation? 